saw yesterday something very important and we said that is um, when we prepare the catalyst, the first thing we have to do is to characterize the catalyst. First, we start with the support, right? Before preparing the catalyst. Then we select the correct active species, which is are going to be our active sites for the reaction. This depends on the reaction. If we have a reaction for, um, I don't know, for um, hydrogenation, we have to select the correct active sites, for example, nickel or platinum or palladium, right? Because we need to have a metal which can absorb the hydrogen, dissociate the molecule of hydrogen, and then one atom of hydrogen is going to attack the double bond and hydrogenate, okay? Uh, it is very important to have an idea about how we can disperse the active species. What is our goal in, in, in order to have a very good catalyst is to have the maximum amount of the active species on the surface accessible for the reaction. This is the key, the key things in catalysis. Because if you don't know how to prepare your catalyst, all the active species will go inside the support and they're not accessible to the reaction and you lose your money, your time and everything. So we have to know how to prepare the catalyst. Not only preparation, I mean the preparation has two different stages. The first is how to prepare it, okay? And the second stage which is very important, how to calcine the catalyst, the calcination means that the first step is that we are going to degas the sample, the excess of water, we heat it up to maybe 100 degrees C, very, very slowly to drive out the water. Remember, we have the solution of the salt, of the metals, and then we have to calcine to break down the ions. Okay, if you have, for example, sulfate, nickel sulfate, the sulfate has to go and we will have on the surface the nickel oxide. Okay, this is our active species, nickel oxide. Now the nickel oxide can stay on the surface or can go inside the support during the calcination. This is why we cal when we calcine the catalyst has to go very slowly, about one degree per minute, and we can go 48 hours, okay? What's happening during this calcination, as I said, is that some of the active species remain on the surface. This is the, are the good active sites. Some of them, they go inside the support, we lose them and some of them, they interact and they react with the support. Okay, you have uh, maybe heard about uh, formation of spinel. Spinel, for example, the alumina can react or can interact first and react with the nickel to fo form the alum nickel alum aluminate. The nickel aluminate is our called spinel and you cannot reduce them anymore, so you lose them. So, one thing is, is, if we lose them, what would happen is you get less nickel on the surface and the nickel has to be reduced. Has to be reduced to zero. And if you are not able to reduce the nickel, you will not have active sites on the surface. So the key word is that your nickel stay interacting with the support, not reacting with the support, interacting to be stable and has to be reduced. If you cannot reduce it, you will not have active species. This is the key thing in, the, in catalysis. So when we do this, is, is you have to wait to test the catalyst. Okay, we have prepared the catalyst and our aim, uh, our goal is to have a good catalyst, a good activity and good selectivity for the catalyst, okay? So how do we know if the catalyst is going to be selective or active or not? You have two ways to do it. Or you take it to the reactor and test it and see if it works or not. And this is, of course, time consuming, hydrogen consuming, energy consuming. Or you need to characterize it, well characterized, in order to know if you have really a good catalyst for the reaction. The first one is going to, to the reactor, is you can do it, you can take a reactor and put your sample there, you make a reaction and see what's going on. But this is not that easy way to do it. The most, the, the most accessible way is to characterize it by chemisorption. So we simulate the reaction by doing chemisorption, okay? For example, hydrogenation, as I said, a hydrogenation catalyst it has to absorb hydrogen, has to so dissociate the hydrogen, okay? Then I can make hydrogen, hydrogen chemisorption on the catalyst and see how the catalyst can absorb and can dissociate the hydrogen. The second thing is just to see how many of these active species remain on the surface. This is very important, okay? So this is called dispersion of the active species. It's going to tell me 
I know how much I put because I prepared my catalyst and I said I want to have 5% by weight, by the, by the weight of the catalyst, of nickel. So I know how much I have. But I don't know where are they. Are they accessible? Are not they accessible? You can have, for example, very sophisticated techniques to, do, to measure the amount of accessible species. For example, you can XPS, ISS. You have a lot of spectroscopic techniques to do with this. But that's just, uh, spectroscopic techniques are very expensive, really. Uh, XPS uh, instrument can, can cost, I don't know, 500, uh, half a million dollars, at least. And it's very, very tedious because you have to keep it under liquid nitrogen. As chemisorption is, has the first option. Why? The first option is that we need to have a technique which is a surface technique. Surface technique, for example, XPS is so, exp so expensive technique, but it's not a surface technique. Why? Because if you understand what XPS is, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, is we have X-ray beam going over the surface of the sam sample to see and disperse ions, electrons, and measure this electron and see what you have on the surface. But the problem is that X-ray will go not only on the first layer, but see second, third, fourth layer. And maybe your nickel is not on the first layer, but in the second and third. They are not accessible for the reaction. The X-ray tells you, yes, you do have it, but you don't have it really on the surface. So we need to select the surface technique for chemisorption, for uh, catalysis, for dispersion. And the best way we do it is a chemisorption. Really everywhere, as I told you yesterday, I travel everywhere. And every catalyst people, catalysis people working in university or industry, they have to work with chemisorption. And they have to do it properly and perfectly so that you can get simulation and you can get an idea if your catalyst really is going to work properly in your reaction. Remember when you, when you characterize your catalyst, you will do it normally at conditions, <coughs> room conditions, room temperature and uh, uh, atmospheric pressure. But of course, you can tell me now, my reaction is going to be at higher pressure, okay? So how, what would happen in higher pressure? The higher pressure can improve what we see on atmospheric pressure. It's better. If atmospheric pressures, say if we have good dispersion, if you go to higher pressure, it's going to be much better because you have diffusion of the molecule, so we can have better dispersion and better activity of the catalyst. But if chemisorption tells you your catalyst is not good, even though you got high pressure, maybe it can improve a little bit, but it's not going to work for the reaction. So I'm going to show you now how we use the chemisorption in order to characterize your catalyst chemis chemically. Not physically, as we said yesterday for the texture. Now we're going to see the active species on the catalyst. Okay, so uh, the chemical, the, the chemisorption is a chemical reaction. Yesterday we saw the physisorption is a physical adsorption where we have reversibility. So we absorb and dissolve. This is what we can do, adsorption. You know, the adsorption and the desorption. We have seen the adsorption isotherm and the desorption can give us information about the shape of the pore. The chemisorption is a real reaction. Okay, you can see it's a real reaction where the heat of adsorption is very high. What does mean is irreversible. Once you absorb CO, for example, you form carbonyl and you cannot take it out. This is why our reference material cannot work for a long time because once you make the chemisorption, make the chemical reaction, it's very difficult to go back. To, to reverse the CO from the nickel. The, the advantage of the chemical adsorption is very fast. Okay? You, you absorb, you put CO or hydrogen, and very fast because the energy of adsorption is very, very high. The reaction is very, very high, and therefore, in a few uh, seconds, you will get complete adsorption of the gas on the, on the surface of the solid. What kind of solid we can, we can characterize with chemisorption? There's no limits. You can do any kind of catalyst, you can characterize it. The only thing you need to understand is how to select the probe molecule. The probe molecules is the molecules we're going to use to titrate or to characterize or to measure the active species on the surface. This is called probe molecules in catalysis. Okay, normally we have three or four known. It's a CO, carbon monoxide. You can have hydrogen, oxygen, CO2, or ammonia. Re really, this is our five or six molecules that are used, widely used are, uh, everywhere to determine the dispersion of active species. Well, only ammonia, it is measures the acidity or acid sites. 
as I said yesterday, not always the metals are the active site, but also the acid site could be the active site in the case of, for example, zeolite. So we characterize this acid site with a base molecule as ammonia. So you can see here we can measure any kind of solids. can be, for example, two metals like cobalt molybdenum, or can be one element, anything you have. For zeolite and reforming catalyst, is we use ammonia, as I said, the acid size, but it can be solution. Any kind of catalyst can be determined, can be measured, and can be seen, say, under the, uh, the real condition of the reaction. What we do is, in chemisorption, we have two, two really two different ways to do chemisorption. The first option is volumetric technique. It's like what you have on your three-flex system. Volumetric technique, as I said yesterday, is a system has a vacuum and has a pressure transducer. Every time we speak about volumetric, means we have to have a good vacuum and a good pressure transducer. Okay, so if we do pressure transducer and if we do a volumetric technique with the pressure transducer and the vacuum, we can get the adsorption isotherm exactly as we did yesterday. We did the, we got the adsorption isotherm for physical. We do the same things here with hydrogen or CO. We get something like that. Okay, the first adsorption isotherm, this one here, is correspond to what? Correspond to the adsorption on the active species chemically absorbed, but also we have some physical absorption by the support, okay? If it's physical absorption, it means that we have reversible, so we can reverse them. The one thing we have to understand is every time we do chemisorption, we only have one type of absorption isotherm, is type one, okay? It is like we, we, say, we saw yesterday with the zeolite, was, or the absorption isotherm was type one or Langmuir absorption isotherm. If you look to this one here, it's not type one. Okay, so what's happening here, we, we considered like physical absorption by the support and the chemical absorption by the active species. But I'm not interested to see the, chemical, the physical absorption by the support. So what we do in this case is after we finish the first absorption isotherm, we apply vacuum to the system, to the sample. Okay, as we said, we have physical absorption by the support, everything reversible, the vacuum is going to take it out. So we're going to retrieve all the physical absorption from the sample. What we still have on the sample is what has been chemisorbed. And this is what is interesting to see. So after we apply a vacuum to the system, I can repeat the analysis under the same conditions, the same pressure and the same, the same temperature. So I get the second adsorption isotherm, this one, the green. Okay, and this is reversible. This is the total chemical adsorption and physical adsorption. And the difference between these two is type one adsorption isotherm, and this is the chemisorption. Okay, so from the type 1 adsorption isotherm, we come here and we calculate the volume of gas absorbed. Once we get the volume of gas, the quantity of gas absorbed, what we need to know is how the gas has been absorbed by the sample. There are two configurations only, it's very easy. Okay, if you are using CO, carbon monoxide, we understand this could be a bit more com complicated because we can have bridging or can have linear absorption. But in chemisorption, we don't care. It's a real bridging or not. If we're comparing samples, once A, B, C, and D, we have a common uh, error. So we, cons we consider a small error and we can compare samples, okay? I will see, for example, sample A, B, C, and D. Which one can absorb more CO means has more active species accessible on the surface. This is very important for us. I don't care if there are five, there are eight, or there are 10. What I care, do care about it is how much is absorbing, if absorbing or not absorbing, okay? So in this case, we say with CO, we have one to one. So the quantity of molecules of CO absorbed, one CO over one nickel. So if I know how many CO has been absorbed, we can tell how many nickel I have on the surface, okay? Then if I have the total, I know 5% has been uh, at the beginning when I prepare my sample. The CO, you tell me you have 3% on the surface. So three divided by five, it gives you 50% or 60% dispersion, okay? So any kind of catalyst, if you have more than 50% dispersion, mean have more, more than 50% of active species on the surface acceptable, is considered to be, to be a good catalyst. But if I get, for example, 10% or 5% dispersion, you lost your time. I can give you a small example. If you're preparing a catalyst with platinum, for example, platinum is very expensive. 
and you prepare, um, I don't know, 100 uh, gram of the catalyst, and you did not know how to prepare the sample, and all the platinum has, has migrated inside the support. How much you lost? $10,000. Okay, so expensive. This is why when we prepare a very expensive catalyst, we prepare only 10 or 15 or 20 milligrams, just in case. Because we don't know. We try to do everything correctly, but sometimes we cannot control it. Okay? The, the problem with this thing is the temperature. The temperature, when you calcine the sample, we have to calcine the sample, and sometimes the calcinations at temperature can center the sample. These molecules can, the atoms, they can, they can move on the surface and they can center. And you center, as I said yesterday, you, you pile that, the, the, the chairs like this, and you, you, you lose activity. Okay, or they can migrate or can inter in interacting and reacting with the support. But in any case, if it's we get a chemisorption like this for CO, we said it will have a good catalyst. Now what's happening if you do hydrogen chemisorption? Is it different as the CO? The hydrogen chemisorption, the first thing happening is a dissociation of the molecule of hydrogen. Okay, so your nickel as, as, a, as hydrogenate, hydrogenating uh, metals has to absorb the hydrogen and has to dissociate the molecule of hydrogen, not only absorb. Some of the metals we use, they, we think they are hydrogenating, but they're not good because they absorb the hydrogen and they stick to the hydrogen. They love the hydrogen and keep it like this. Oh, it's not interesting for us. What is interesting for us is that they absorb the hydrogen and they dissociate the molecule of hydrogen into two atoms. And that atom of hydrogen becomes very active for the hydrogenation. So the stoichiometry factor, in this case, the, the relationship between the molecules, the adsorbate, and the atoms is called a stoichiometry factor. When you read the paper on, on catalysis, they're going to speak about a stoichiometry factor. For CO, is one to one. One CO to one active site. For the hydrogen, it's two, because one molecule of hydrogen has two atoms of hydrogen, and each atom of hydrogen absorbs over nickel, so the stoichiometry factor is two. So whatever we get from the hydrogen, chemisorption, we multiply by two, and this gives us the amount of nickel we have on the surface. So in any case, in any case, CO or hydrogen is going to get something like this, and from this amount of hydrogen or amount of CO absorbed, I can measure the amount of active species accessible <coughs> on the surface. So I don't have to take the catalyst to the reactor, so I can tell I have 50% dispersion, then I can get, take the risk and make the reaction because I know my catalyst is going to work. But if I 10%, there's no way to go to the reactor, it's not going to work. So we can understand, we can have an idea about the catalyst before going into the reactor. All right, this is the first thing we do with chemisorption. The second thing we do with chemisorption is this nice figures, okay? So we see we can do the same things we do here with the chemisorption, but here we can do it at different temperature, okay? I can start at room temperature and go higher and higher. And of course, every time you go higher in the absorption temperature, you're gonna get less physisorption, okay? Because the physisorption, as I said, is very weak. If you raise the temperature, that physics option is going to be eliminated. But when I do this at different temperature, I will show you later, you can do, you can measure the isostatic heat of absorption. Okay? If you explain to your, rev to your referee, if you like to publish a paper and you speak about the things here, about the isostatic heat of absorption, he's gonna love you. Because he's gonna say, you know what you're talking about. What does mean the isostatic heat of absorption? This is the first thing. Is, okay, the isostatic heat of absorption, but what does it mean? Okay, does it mean that your active species are active, but not that active to absorb irreversibly the reaction. Another word, if you're doing hydrogenation of uh, benzene, okay, so that benzene is gonna come to the active species and the hydrogen is gonna come also close to the active species. Okay, so the nickel is going to start interacting with the hydrogen, dissociate the, the molecule of hydrogen, and one of the hydrogen pump is going to hydrogenate the benzene. But what is going to happen in our reaction is that after reaction, this benzene is already re reduced to the, you know, to maybe uh, cyclohexene. It has to come out, okay? Has to free the site so we have a new molecule to come and react. So the, uh, the cat catalysis process is very, very fast absorb, react, and dissolve. But if the isostatic heat of absorption is so strong, the benzene is gonna stick to the active species 
And what will happen to this? We poison the catalyst. This is what you go, poisoning of the catalyst is absorption irreversible on the active sites. Okay, so this is, I need to know not only the absorption, but how strong is the active, active sites to interact with the active species. Okay, so the only, way, the only way to can do it is just to make the absorption isotherm at different temperature and to determine the isostatic heat of absorption. Uh, when you are talking about the surface, dispersion as a surface, in case we have zeolite that have cavities, so like internal surface, does it, is it measured? Of also? course. Everything accessible. This is why my, the word, the key word is accessible. accessible. Everything accessible to the reactant. Okay? Remember, as I said yesterday, if you have the active species on the surface, it's going to die in five minutes because it has no surface. It's only maybe one or maybe half a square meter per gram. The internal is the, is the most important thing. So all the active species have to go inside the pore where we have the area. Okay? And this pore, this is why we measure the texture of the support yeah, should be accessible for the reactant. You see how we combine all these techniques? We combine all these techniques to characterize the catalyst. We have to combine, combine the physics option plus the chemist option. Okay? So we'll have a good idea about the activity of our catalyst. I will come later on this one here, but as I just mentioned to you, is a QSC is very important in catalysis. Uh, I missed my, I'm not sure if I missed the point also. So in case of uh, uh, poisoning the catalyst, uh -huh. or catalysis, so how to prevent it? You cannot prevent it. You cannot prevent it. So it is uh, depending on the reaction. Then what, what you have to do, yeah, well, we, can, we can work with the temperature, okay? Some of, the, uh, uh, some of the, the condition we can change a little bit, okay? For example, we can raise the temperature, okay? But by raising the temperature to prevent the, in the strong interaction, you can center the active species. So we have too high temperature, then the active species start moving much faster and the center, okay? So you, you, you improve one thing, but you just get a negative point. So in this case, we don't select this that metals for this reaction, okay? Just one question. You said that the chemisorption curve uh, has only type one. Uh -huh. uh, if my catalyst is microporous or mesoporous or et cetera, shouldn't it be inflected here on the amount of salt at the beginning or et cetera? No, because it's logical. All the pores are accessible, okay? I mean the rate of by which it's absorbing. So it shouldn't at first increase then like this? No, because we are talking about chemisorption. The chemisorption is very fast and very strong. Okay? They are strongly absorbed. Okay? So they don't care if it's a small pore or a large pore. As long as they can go inside, it's, it's very fast. Okay? Well, if you go and you do, for example, chemisorption and start a very low dosing, okay? You could see, I have some examples. Okay? If you have micropore and mesopore, you could see small change on the shape of the absorption isotherm. Okay, you can see, for example, this one is the micropores and this one is the mesopores. Because we can explain this, because we said, in chemisorption, uh, in the micropores, we have very high energy. So it can attract faster, but this is a few seconds. Okay? Not significant. Not significant. And, and that's not really, we don't care too much about it, because what we do care is about the total. Okay? So, but if you like to do a, a real refining on the analysis and do give it, you know, you're a student, you like to see exactly what's going on, then you can dose very small amount, maybe, I don't know, 0.2 cc per gram, okay, of gas, very slowly, and see how it can absorb. And you expand the absorption isotherm, maybe you can get 100 points, so you can see maybe like this, okay? But what does mean of this? You know already you have two pores in physics option, so, okay? You agree? Yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> do you have any questions? Please, don't sleep, okay? Otherwise, I'm going to bring you coffee. <laughs> this is nice. You're, gonna, you, you're going to use these techniques because now you have the instrument, and you will see how nicely you can, you can present your paper and you can, be, you can publish your paper if you can explain these techniques very well and you can prevent, for example, taking your catalyst into the reactor and make the, the, the reactor... The, Test the, 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 testing the catalyst, in this case, you can prevent it and you can do it very fast with the chemisorption. Okay? So, the metal, the, uh, the, the chemisorption gave us the metal dispersion, give us the active particle size, how much they are, how big they are, and small. How this, is the, how this, for example, in this case here, how this can affect our activity, the larger the active size, the worse will be the catalyst. Okay? If I have a particles having 20 particles inside, 
I just see the surface, the active metal surface area. This I'm going to talk about a bit later. We have two surface area. Please don't get confused when you talk about surface area. We have a specific surface area of the support measured by BT equation, and we have the active metal surface area is for chemisorption. If this is your particle, active particles, you have many, 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 many small particles inside. Where we have the reaction, only on the surface, and this area is the active metal surface area. Okay, so when we talk about surface area, don't get confused. So I'm going to talk here only on the active metal surface area. So the smaller the particle, the higher will be the active metal surface area. Okay, because all these small particles inside, they will be exposed and has its own surface area, they will be more and more active. This is why the active metal or active particle size, we should keep them very, very small. Okay, so the smallest they are, the better will be our activity in the catalyst. And the isosteric heat of absorption, as I said, we can measure the heat of absorption by applying the famous equations clausus clapeyron Okay, the, as I said, what this is just explained to you is it's exactly the same, the first absorption isotherm, the second one, and we apply the, the, the Langmuir models, it's a type 1 absorption isotherm. Anything we can fit, it just to have a linear, so we can get the visa beam or the volume or the monolayer here, and this corresponds to the amount of active uh, or the probe molecule absorbing over the active species. Well, this is just the models, okay? Once we get the active, the, the amount of gas absorbing on the surface, what we do with it? The first thing we do is knowing the correlation coefficient or the stoichiometry factor, we can calculate the amount of active species accessible on the surface. This is the most important thing in chemisorption. So by knowing the stoichiometry factor, we can calculate the amount of the monolayer. This is the amount of gas absorbed from the absorption isotherm, the monolayer. This is the, we go from volume into number of moles, and then we multiply by 100, 100 to get the percentage, okay? And the percent weight on the sample we have. Okay, we have to tell the program how much we ha I have from the beginning. I have 5%, I have 10%, okay? And then from VSAB-M, it tells you how much I have on the surface, and therefore I can calculate the dispersion, okay, like this one here. For example, this is a platinum alumina, we have a reference materials, giving us 31% dispersion, okay? It's not very active, it's not a real, real catalyst, it's just only for our reference materials, okay? These people, they do our, this metals only for us. So we design the metals, what we need to have, and they did it for us between 30 and 40% dispersion. Okay, it's not a, real, a center material, but only the reference materials, just for us to know if our, some, if our instrument's working or not. I don't finish here, okay? So this is very important as one or two, okay? Some people they said, well, we don't get, agree with you because the CO in the literature, we can see CO have bridging. We have one to two, two to one, or one to one, okay? You're right. I, I have no discussion about this because it's right, but what do I care about this? I don't care if it's two to one or one to one. I'm comparing my sample A, B, C, and D, and tell me you have 30% dispersion. If I have two, we're gonna be 60. So I'm getting one, I'm getting 30, so it's good, okay? So you can convince the people, it, is, it does not matter too much if you're taking the stoichiometry factor of two or one or one half, there's no problem, okay? But to, in order to uh, make it easy, we consider it one to one and work very, very well. Everywhere, everywhere they work with CO, chemisorption, one to one. If you have hydrogen, there's no problem, because have two to one. Then, this is the formula, how we calculate the dispersion and give me the percent dispersion. Get 31%, good catalyst. I get 50%, much better. You cannot expect to have 100%. Okay? Some of the people I was giving lecturing, and the people, hey, I got 200% dispersion. And he was very happy. Okay? So I th at the beginning, I thought he was just joking. And this later on, I found out he was talking seriously 200% dispersion. When we get 200% dispersion, yes, we can have 200% dispersion, but how we got 200% dispersion? In two cases, if you have, when you, everything when we do this here, the first step is to reduce the, the metals, okay? Remember after we calcine the catalyst under uh, oxygen, it is oxide, nickel oxide, the platinum oxide, all oxide. But the oxide are not the active species, are the reducible. The species are the active species, okay? So when you reduce, it become very, very active. Now, if you have PPM of oxygen somewhere, 
Some people, after reduction, after hydrogen, to remove the hydrogen, they use helium, okay, to clean the sample from hydrogen at high temperature. But if your helium contains 5 ppm of oxygen, okay, it's capable to passivate the, the, the nickel, the recently reduced nickel. Okay, very active. And you've passivated, means that you have small amount of nickel oxide on the surface. And when you do CO chem absorption, the CO is very strongly absorbed, it's very, very, very strong. And therefore, it's going to have CO over the nickel and also CO chem absorption and reacting with the oxygen. Okay? So you have one CO over the oxygen, one CO over the nickel. So you have double. Okay? Then you go, if you have 50% or 80% dispersion for the good catalyst, now you're going to get 160%. Okay, so don't don't be ha very happy because you have a problem. That's why I told him, don't be very happy. You have a problem because you cannot have more than 100%, and nobody can get 100%. You can get maybe 80, 75, the good catalyst, but never 100%. Okay, so it is very important to understand when we do the chemisorption. After we do chemisorption, we measure the active metal surface area. Is an, again, it's very, very important. As I said, this is the area where the reactions take place. The higher the active metal surface area, the higher will be the activity of the catalyst because we have more surface where the reaction is taking place. Okay? So also we can have this. Is this is a formula. As I said, you're going to have this, uh, this, this presentation also in the book. This equations. And this, the last one is the size of the active particles, D. Okay? In, in the oil refineries, where they have tons of the catalysts, every day they take small samples from the top, they have the weight on the reactor, they take small amount of samples in the top, the middle on the bottom of the reactor. And we measure only the D value. Okay? If the D value is increasing, they have to shut down the reactor. Why? Because if you're going larger D, you are centering your sample, you are losing activity. Okay? If you lose the activity, you have a tons of catalysts. So big, big reactors. And this is a million of dollars. <coughs> one, one time, that happened to us in Venezuela when I was working there. We sent the catalyst the first day. Okay? We have one, one ship of, react of catalysts from, from Shell, from uh, Amsterdam. We loaded there, and we didn't know too much about it. And uh, some of the engineering, they raised the temperature very fast. And the D went from, uh, I think it was, was 4 to 16 Armstrong. So four times. So we lost in one day the activity four times. Lost, lost activity. We lost a million dollars. Anyway, but this is very important. So if your D is increasing, be your centering your sample, you have to avoid it. And this is the temperature, really, which is kind of causing the centering because the temperature causes the vibration of the molecule or the atom, sorry, and can center very fast. So this is important if information. This we can do it in maybe in two, three hours. Very fast in the chemisorption. This differs from the main analysis of chemisorption. Yeah. yeah so this there are two analyses, the D analysis and the chemisorption. Yes. Okay. Your system can go from physisorption to, this is what I'm talking about? From physisorption yes, to chemisorption. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, is this automatic? The same run as chemisorption. The same run is you can get all the information. Okay, just you see what I showed to you is the absorption isotherm. Okay, once you get the absorption isotherm, everything is calculated automatically. Okay. All right. Well, this I just show you the so stoichiometry factor. As you can see, for CO is one to one. You can have uh, hydrogen chemisorption is two, a dissociation of molecule of hydrogen, or you can have hydrogen oxidation. It's a surface reaction. Hydrogen oxygen, hydrogen titration. Okay. These three methods are very, you have to, in, as you're working in this, in, in this uh, atmosphere of catalysis, you need to deal with these three equations very, very, very good. Okay, you have CO, you have hydrogen, uh, hydrogen, CO, titration. Hydrogen, oxygen, titration, sorry. The only way, the only catalyst which is, that does give you a very strange absorption isotherm is a palladium. Okay, this is absorption isotherm for palladium. Why we get this shape of absorption isotherm? Because palladium can form hydride very fast. Palladium has a, the, the property to adsorb and to absorb hydrogen. Okay? In this case, if you take this amount of hydrogen to, to determine the dispersion, you're going to have 200% dispersion. Okay? So we know this is in this case of palladium, we cannot work at atmospheric pressure. How can we prevent this? It to work at higher temperature. 
usually about 120 degrees. Well, I, I forget to tell you that all the chemisorption we have done before is at room temperature, about 35, 30 degrees C. Okay, just leave the sample at room temperature and we make the chemisorption. Only the palladium will have to work at 120 degrees to avoid the, uh, the absorption and just have the adsorption. Okay, if you go to higher temperature, then you can get type 1 adsorption isotope. Okay, you see here, this is an example. See here, it started with this one here and keep going and keep raising the temperature. Once we get 120 degrees, we get type 1 adsorption isotherm, and then we can get 50 or 60 percent dispersion. Otherwise, you're going to get 200 percent dispersion. Okay, the isostatic heat of adsorption. I, I love this thing here because it really gives me an idea about how strong are these active species, how weak or how strong. Okay, as I said, you, you apply the isostatic, the Clausius clapeyron by going from the adsorption isotherms into isobars. Okay, the isotherm is a constant temperature, isobar is constant pressure. Okay, so we go here and said, okay, I'm going to work at a constant pressure. I do this here, so I have different temperature and different pressure, a different uh, quantity as a constant pressure. For example, this one here. One cell pressure, I get one temperature, second, third, and fourth. So I go from adsorption isotherm into uh, adsorption isobars, and I can calculate the heat of adsorption, isostatic heat of adsorption, as a function of degree of coverage. I have my degree of coverage, 100% of the surface. It tells me you have 50% very strong, 40% very weak, 20% really, really weak. So you can determine, you can discriminate about how many. So in this case, in other words, I could have, for example, very nice, uh, uh, very nice dispersion. But not all the active species on the surface are active because some of them they are weak and some of them are very strong. Okay? The combination of the dispersion plus the isosteric heat of absorption I can tell how many active species I have really are going to work at my reaction condition, temperature and pressure. Okay? Weak in terms of what? Term on absorption. Okay? What's happening? I'm absorbing my CO, for example, at room temperature. What's happening when I go to 200 degrees C? It's going to be active. If it does not hold the CO at higher temperature, at my reaction temperature, then it's meaningless to me. I'm going to show you, for example, on the ammonia. Okay, the ammonia you have acid sites, okay, and you have sample A and sample B. Sample A has three times more acid sites than sample B. But I'm not going to work at, atmosphere, at room temperature. I'm going to work maybe at 300 degrees C. All the chemical reactions take place about th between 300 and 400 degrees C at high, high pressure. My goal is that my acid site has to hold the ammonia at the reaction temperature, okay? If I absorb the hydrogen, uh, the ammonia at room temperature, and when I go to 150 degrees C, all the ammonia is gone, then it's not acid for my reaction, okay? It's exactly what's happening here. They can absorb CO very well at room temperature, but when I go to higher temperature, the isostatic heat of absorption is down. It says, it's nothing, it's very small. It means that when I go to my reaction condition, my sites, they're not active anymore, okay? So you see here how we, how we go step by step. I know it's very well dispersed. But how many of this dispersion of the active species on the surface are good for my reaction? So I need to combine all these equations. But that's very easy. In the same sample, you can do everything. Okay? And at the end, you get very nice view about your catalyst. Here an example. See, for the isosteric heat of absorption, I have two catalysts. Okay? You see here the, 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 the site okay, as a function of coverage of the surface. I get to a point here where it come down. So what's happening here? This is the chemisorption, and this is the physisorption with the support. See, it goes down very fast. But I do have a lot of active species, very homogeneous, very, very similar, OK? So my reactions are going to work here very, very well in this case. This is a bad catalyst. So you start at the beginning very strong acid, the active size. It's going to work for five minutes. Why? Because all the active size, the rest of them, are going to lose their activity when we raise the temperature. Okay? So by doing this, you can have a very good idea about the distribution of the active species of the catalyst. <coughs> this is a very important thing. Is how are they distributed? The distribution of the active species on the surface of your catalyst. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, do you have any questions, please? Up to this point, it's clear? This has to be like this. 
in your, in your case, when you work in catalysis, you need to understand this very well. If you mention one word in chemisorption and you like to publish a paper, you need to explain a little bit, bit at least the, the most important and the basic thing, so your referee knows that you know what you're talking about. If you don't mention chemisorption at all, it's okay. But if you mention it, you need to explain it, okay? Nowadays, all the referees, I told you, is are very picky because we have seen so many public publications really meaningless. They just publish paper like this, and some of the journal accepted because they want to fill papers, fill, fill just the journal. But some of the, the journal, for example, Applied Catalysis, which is, was born with us in Belgium, with Professor Delmon. This was my, my supervisor, he's very famous. Now he's a very old man. So, but this is with five students at the Catholic University in louvain la neuve We did the Applied Catalysis Journal. And we are five of us, they are the referees for the Applied Catalysis. Okay? So we talk to each other and we need to make sure that anything published in the Applied Catalysis should be good. Okay? Should deserve the time to read it. Otherwise, it, you know, they're meaningless. The Journal of Catalysis, for example, also they're very picky. If you like to publish a paper, they need to know that you understand what you're talking about. So these techniques are very easy. Once you get uh, used to them, they give you very good information, really, about your catalyst. The second part of chemisorption are the, you are going to miss here, unfortunately, but you don't have the flowing technique. But I have, I have a solution for that. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> the techniques, we need to combine the volumetric technique with the flowing technique. The flowing technique is a TPR, temperature program reduction. Yes, you can. If they absorb CO or hydrogen, you can apply these techniques. The only down condition is your sample has to absorb CO, has to, has to be first fixed, okay? Will not change during the reaction. And absorb CO. Huh? <coughs> yeah, this is, could be, for example, the zeolite has no metal size. Okay, I can have acid side, basic side, base side, or act of metal side. These are three sides you can have in your catalyst. If you have base side, you use CO2. CO2 is as is, is, is an acid. Okay, you titrate your base side with CO2. You have acid side, you titrate with a base molecule, with ammonia, propylamine, whatever it is. If you have metals, you can use CO or hydrogen. So okay. Enzyme catalysis, do they rely on this technique? Yes. Yeah, so there's some. The of my, uh, yes, you have to know. What kind of, of adsorption can take place of your catalyst? Okay? But there's, nowadays there are so many publications, you can get an idea, okay? and you can test it. Okay? In publication, I can tell you something, it's very important. You don't have to have results every time. Sometimes we don't get any things, but we can tell. Be careful, if you use this thing here, you don't get anything. This is a good publication. Okay, you are warning others, don't use this, because I test this, I did this, I did this. So the nice about, about these things here is that somewhere, maybe in Japan, you read your paper, and I can tell you exactly what you did is the wrong way. Maybe if you do that, that way, it will be better, you see? This is the nice things about when we do congresses. The congresses is we meet people, because we see, we see them, their names, publication, we can talk to each other, okay? But if you don't get any result, it's a good Paper. You are telling people, don't do this because I did not get anything. Do you accept such papers in your paper? Of course. Yeah. It's very, it is, it is very important. Okay? As long as you convince me that is what you did is correct, it's a very nice publication. Not always we expect to have something. <laughs> Sometimes we don't have anything. Okay. So TPD is the key, key techniques here. Okay? The temperature program oxidation, then the in situ surface area measurement, and temperature program reaction. This is the reaction of the things, last thing we can do. All right, TPR is a course I gave for one week. One week only on reduction, okay? Because the main things on catalysis is how to reduce your sample. As I said, not the oxides are the active species, are the reducible. Whatever you reduce your sample, whatever this was called the percent the reduction on your sample. Okay, you did your catalyst, and now you know how many of these active species I will be able to reduce under my conditions, under the reaction. Okay, so the TPR, and also the TPR is going to give you information about how good is your support, the role of the support in your catalyst. What, uh, what is the role of the support? It's to disperse the active species and to stabilize the active species when you go to higher temperature. This is the role of the support. 
Okay? So the only way you can tell if the support is good or bad is to do TPR. How do I do TPR? Very easy. You just flow a 10% hydrogen argon, for example, over your sample, and you heat the sample under a certain ramping rate, 10 degrees per minute, and you can see once the reactions take place or reduction take place, you're consuming the hydrogen. Your analytical system, a mass spectrometer or TCD, is going to give you a peak, okay? And if it's, if it's calibrated, you can calculate the amount of hydrogen being reduced and the temperature at which has been reduced. Okay, so I can calculate from the amount of hydrogen how much I can reduce and the temperature give me information about how stable is my axis species. For example, what I do, I have a nickel oxide, all right, then I run the nickel oxide by itself, TPR. And the TPR tells me the nickel oxide reduced at 350 degrees C. Now I support my nickel oxide on the alumina, okay. Then I suppose that the nickel, the alumina is going to stabilize my nickel oxide. So I do a TPR. If the nickel oxide is interacting with my nickel, the reduction temperature is going to go shift higher temperature, maybe 50 degrees C above. Means that the nickel is very well stabilized over the active species. But sometimes when I do this, I don't see anything. It's because the alumina reacted with the, with the nickel and formed aluminate, and you, do, you cannot reduce it anymore. You lost your catalyst. Okay? So TPR very easy can give you this information. The post chemistry option, we post CO or hydrogen, and we can see how much of the dispersion of the species. The TPD is, for example, hydrogenating. I absorb hydrogen over my catalyst, okay? And I keep going on my temperature, ramping temperature 10 degrees per minute, and see at which temperature the hydrogen will be removed. And this gives me the information about how strong or how weak my, my active site for the hydrogenating. TPO is TPO, TPR or TPO, you can oxidize and reduce can tell you information about how many cycles you can regenerate your catalyst, okay? Because sometimes as a poisoning your catalyst or deactivating your catalyst is, do, is due to the deposition of carbon. We go crack, for example, crack into a molecule, you have carbon and you cover the active species and they're not accessible to the reaction anymore. So you have to remove the carbon, okay? How so you, this? you just flow TPO, you just flow oxygen and oxygen it will react with the carbon and give you CO, CO2. And you can even quantify the amount of, of CO you're getting. So you can adjust your reaction to, prom to promote or to de-promote the deposition of carbon. So you, you get less carbon. In yeah. the case of desorption, we're talking about <coughs> hydrogen. So basically, we remove the hydrogen from the catalyst? Yeah. I'm going to show you an example how nice it is. You, you, just, just one minute. OK, the TPR is just, I said, it's just a reaction. As you see, it's a reduction by the hydrogen. So in order to quantify the amount of oxide, the first, I, the first things I do, I oxidize the sample. Why oxidize, oxidize the sample? Because I need to have the stoichiometry reduction. If you have PTOX, okay, and you have hydrogen, then you cannot tell how many of platinum you have. But if you have PTO, by knowing the amount of hydrogen and the stoichiometry is one to one, knowing the amount of hydrogen, you can tell how much platinum you have on the surface. So this is, you don't have to go, for example, atomic absorption to know how much plat platinum you have. Directly here, you can get the quantifying, and this is, is is this bulk react reduction. So you reduce not only the surface, but everything in your catalyst, okay? So by knowing the amount of hydrogen, you can tell how much platinum you have on your catalyst. See, remember, this, when you prepare your catalyst, you need to know exactly how much you have on the surface, on your catalyst. By TPR, you can tell uh, directly, not only how many active species you have, but also the total. Here is this TPR profile, can give you an information about if you have two metals, for example, if you have any synergy between them. Uh, well, you are very young people. In my age, when we have, uh, I, I was working like you, there was a big problem between the cobalt and molybdenum catalyst, okay, for the hydrotitanium catalyst. We know that cobalt has some activity, the molybdenum has some activity, but when you put them together, the activity goes three times more, okay? And the people didn't know why. Why are you doing this? We know that the CO is promoting the molybdenum or the nickel promoting the molybdenum, but we did not know how it does. So what we did is we did TPR for nickel itself, cobalt itself, and we put it molybdenum in the middle. So we know that when you, do, when you have cobalt and molybdenum, you create a peak which does not exist for the cobalt or molybdenum itself, okay? 
and that peak is formation of uh, the synergy between cobalt molybdenum and what we discover is that the area under the peak is related directly to the activity of the catalyst. So the higher the peak, the better will be the activity of the catalyst. So that moment is between Topso and Delmon. We have a Topso in, in, in Denmark and Delmon in Belgium. So we got together at that times and we published so many papers on that times uh, talking about the synergy between the two metals and the promotion of one metal with a second one. In this case, it's cobalt to molybdenum or nickel molybdenum. In this case, also you can see if you have any alloy between these two. You can see, for example, well, the first thing you can get is, is how many peaks you have on your TPR profile. In this case, for example, you have hematite. You have three peaks because FeTO3 go to FeTO4, FeO to iron. It's very easy. Okay, to make interpretation of this is very easy. But if you get three or four or five, don't be don't be scared. It's just because the TPR is a function of the particle size. The smaller the particle size, the, the faster is the reduction. This is called mechanism of reduction. Okay, I can have four or five or six. It's just the same thing. It's just iron oxide or nickel oxide, but the particles, active particles, are different size, so they reduce in a different way. Okay, if you have, for example, in this case here, we have A and B, which is platinum and uh, ruthenium. If you do platinum, you get something like that. Ruthenium, you get something like that. If you mix them together physically, you get a profile which is some of these two. You see, it's exactly the same. This is mixing 50-50. But if you heat them at 450 degrees C for a certain time, you get this peak like this, this profile. What does mean that it's this not this, not this or not this? It's an alloy formed by these two elements. So you can tell the synergy between these two if they are reacting or not. Okay? So you, this is only few things about the TPR, but you can get so many different information about these techniques. Okay. What kind of reduction we can do? Any kind of solids we can have because the delta G is, is, is negative. As long as you have the free energy is negative, you can reduce your sample. So there's no, no, no limitation. The pulse scheme absorption is the first thing we do is to measure the dispersion. We pulse CO into the sample. We measure, we know a, a, a loop, no loop the volume. We inject into the sample. The first swap peak is very small because everything's been held by the sample. We keep going until we get saturation. We know every time the area of speak, every time how much we're in injecting, we can back calculate to say how much CO been absorbed. So we get to our reaction, we know the stoichiometry factor is one to one, so we can calculate the amount of the active species on the surface. This is only a surface technique. And this is important for us because only we need the surface where the reactions take place. Well, this is dispersion, this is like this. That the, the temperature program desorption. This is very important. Okay. Suppose you like to have a reaction for, redu for re reduction of the enzyme. An example, easy one. Okay. I don't know which temperature I have to work. Okay. Well, how do I know if at 400 degrees, 350? Everyone tells different temperature. Okay. But you cannot guess. In catalysis, you cannot guess. You need to have something to prove that says your reaction is good. Okay. I absorb hydrogen. Okay. And I dissolve the hydrogen. Okay. I go up on that temperature. Okay, I have three peaks. I have 393, 493, and 570. If I like to work here, I know only this one here, this peak here, the area under this peak, tell me amount of hydrogen is going to be active for my reaction because all of this here will be degassing, will be dissolved. So these are not active sites for my reaction, only this one here. So maybe this one here is 50% uh, of the total. So I can tell my that I have only 50% on this catalyst active for my reaction if I work as this, uh, sorry, if I work as this temperature. If I work here, only have 50%. If I work here, I have nothing. If I work here, I have this and this. So I can tell how many active species I do have for my reaction at which temperature I would like to work. Okay, so I can tell temperature to re for my reaction and I can tell how many active species I do have for my reaction. So the TPD is very important techniques to do too. Because we can do, you, once, uh, once you do the pulse chemistry option, you have your sample already saturated with hydrogen at room temperature. You just have to dissolve it at a f function of temperature and you get this profile. For acidity, ZSM5, this is zeolite. We saturate the sample with ammonia, okay, and we do dissolution. Okay, you have two peaks. Okay, you have, you don't have, remember the, in the acid side, you can have bronzed acid side and lowest acid side. This, in this case, you cannot differentiate between them. Okay, you get to go to infrared to do it. But in this case, I don't care. I have weak and strong. 
okay? I can quantify the amount of ammonia I have, one ammonia to one acid side, so I can tell how many acid sides you have. Now, if I, if I absorb and dissolve a different ramping rate, okay, I can apply the Kissinger equation. It's not Kissinger, the one from the United States. No, no, this is different Kissinger, okay? This is nice Kissinger. And if you know the, the maximum of each one of the peak, you can calculate the heat of absorption, okay? According to this equation, so we can calculate the heat of desorption or absorption. I can tell the first peak, this heat is 67.1. It's very weak. So I have too many of them, but they are weak, okay, for my reaction. The second one is good because 162. My reaction, more or less, when I get 150, is good, okay? But if you get 60 or 50, it's very weak. So I can tell how many active species by integrating this peak are active for my reaction. Okay, but this you have to absorb and dissolve, and you have to have to have an ethical system, TCD or mass spec, to see what's going on into the desorption. Okay, nowadays nobody uses ammonia for acidity. Okay, you can read papers, nobody using ammonia. Why? Because ammonia, is such a small molecule, can go inside all kinds of pores. Okay, the small pores, larger pores, larger pores. But the small pores, we have a diffusion for my reaction. My reactants are larger than this, so the my reactant cannot go here. Even though very, very many of them, but they are meaningless for me. I need to integrate, I need to measure how many active species I have where the pores are accessible for my reaction. Okay? Then what you do is you have to use largest molecule, not ammonia, but in this case we use isopropylamine. Okay? The isopropylamine, we absorb it and we dissolve it. And we can see this is a reaction called Hoffman elimination. Okay, what is happening in this case is that one uh, one active site is going to, uh, to absorb over uh, the isopropylamine, and when you dissolve it, you form propylene. And uh, one mole of propylene corresponds to one mole of acid sites. So you can measure the acidity of your sample. Very easy with isopropylamine only on the pores which is adequate for my reaction. Okay, you do exactly the same things, okay? We can get the heat of absorption as we did before just by applying the Kissinger equation. All right, well, if you have metal oxide, you can use methanol. The methanol also is this very nice probe molecule. Okay, you absorb methanol and you dissolve it. And you see what's coming out from the reaction. You can have the, ac the acid side, the base side, and the redox side by using methanol. Methanol is very nice, and everybody now is using methanol as a probe molecule to determine acid side, uh, base side, uh, or redox side. Well, I'm not going to talk about this, how you did it. This is, how, this is the reactions, in just to change you. Acid side, if you form di dimethyl ethers, mean you have acid side. If you form carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide, you get base sides. Or you have formaldehyde, you can have redox sites. Okay? So by quantifying this, you can see how many active, active sites you have in your, in your catalyst. Well, I'm not going about this. This is how to do the reaction. I just think this is we finish. Application for all kinds of catalysts. There's no limitation for any kind of catalyst. For a few cells, you can use 2PR, a pulse chemisorption, to quantify the active species. For partial oxidation, you can also use temperature program oxidation and TPD. For cracking, you can see TPD for ammonia, because of acid sites. For reforming, you can use surface area and metal dispersion. For any kind of reaction a catalyst, I'm not going to mention all of them, but you see just a few uh, examples, and you can use anything for that. Fischer trap. Everybody now using Fischer trap reaction. Okay, the Fischer trap reaction is you use CO and hydrogen, you mix them together, and you form gasoline. Okay, very pure gasoline, no impurity on this. Okay, one CO to three hydrogen, you mix them together over a cobalt uh, uh, iron catalyst, aluminum catalyst, and you can start from gases. You get liquid, and this is, your, this is benzene for your car. Okay. So, and what's nice about it is you can use any biomass or any trash. I don't know whether you have so much trash here, why you don't use them. You can use the trash, you have gasification of the trash, okay? And this, uh, I tell you, this is uh, in, for example, United States, in New York, we use all the trash to do uh, fissure drop, and you can heat up the water also, okay? So this is, how, this is why maybe here a politics is also the same, because you know it's a lot of money of this, okay? <laughs> But, but then for later. Oh, okay. So, but you can take any biomass on the trash, you put them in a reactor, you heat it up at 900 degrees C under helium, no oxygen, only helium, and you produce CO and hydrogen. And CO hydrogen, you can go to a reactor and form gasoline. Okay? Well, thank you. You see here, I put it even in Arabic. 
Any questions? See, I had to go very fast because they gave me only one hour. Okay, I, otherwise, we'll give more examples and more details, but it's maybe next time when so I come back to Lebanon. I have one question. Uh -huh. uh, concerning the CO, you said that there is a debate whether one or two is documented. And you mentioned the striking difference 30% dispersion, 60%. First, was there a solution for this debate to reach a clear fact? No. Second, uh, won't it differ between 30% and 60%? Yeah. Uh, maybe you're getting a bit, uh, maybe I, I was not, I did not explain very well this, okay? What's happening? None of the techniques, does not exist any technique which gives you absolute numbers. I, I know. That. You know that. I, you agree on this? I believe in this. Well, this is very important. If you believe this, then you can understand what I'm going to tell you, okay? So if we're not, we don't care about the absolute number, only relative numbers, okay? And you have some catalysts, I have another catalyst, and the same family of catalysts. We would like to know which one is more active. Just for comparison. For so comparison. Don't the real number. We don't care about the real Just number. Like okay? You agree? Yes, it's Perfect. Clear. Good. <laughs> Any other questions? I really thank you very much because he really uh, asked a lot of questions, which is very important for me. Because if you don't ask any questions, there are two things. Or you don't understand anything was very bad, or everybody understood very well everything. Okay? <laughs> That's good, 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 uh, good questions. The, what I showed you here only has been done at room temperature and atmospheric pressure. Okay. Now, when I go to my reaction condition, high temperature and high pressure, the situation will be completely different. Okay. I don't mention this because I don't want to scare you too much. But nowadays, all these characterizations are done at the reaction condition pressure and temperature, okay? If you have a reactor, for example, here, okay, you're gonna work a high temperature, high pressure. You need to characterize your catalyst at that condition, okay? Reduction, dispersion, everything. I just uh, pre recently presented a paper in Brazil for the Congress where I presented the um, uh, fischer trop catalyst. The fischer trop catalyst, they have 20% iron or 20% cobalt on alumina, very large particles, okay? When you do dispersion at room temperature, atmospheric pressure, you get between 3 and 5% dispersion. But you, when you, talk, you go to the reaction, they're very, very active, okay? Why is, why is that? It's because when I do post chemisorption, for example, in the CO, when you do post chemisorption, you have a carrier gas at, at, at room temperature and atmospheric pressure, the CO goes very fast. Only the, the small portion of the, of the metals will absorb. But when I go to the reaction condition, for example, 50 bar, the CO is going to move very slowly over the catalyst and going to diffuse inside the large particles. And I show the, 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 the result from 4% to 80% dispersion. Okay? So what it does mean is that when I do my reaction high, high pressure, all my reactants has enough pressure to diffuse inside the large particles. So this, now, this is, nowadays, they accept Characterization, atmospheric, not everybody has high pressure reactor, okay? So now, now it is because I'm in the, in, the, in the middle of everybody, I just designed a small device, which is, is going to be ready in one month, okay, in Spain. This is why I come very often to Spain, and next week I'm coming to Spain. And the small device has a TCD inside, it has mass flow controller, and can work from atmospheric pressure up to 100 bar. And you can connect it to any flowing technique. For example, on the, on the Triflex. Triflex, you don't have a TCD, so you don't, get, you don't have TPR. But this tech, small device, you connect it to the instrument, and you flow the gas through the sample, and come back to the TCD, and you got TPR, pulse chemisorption, anything you want. You want. But also, if you have a reactor, high, high pressure reactor, you can connect it to your, high, to your reactor, and you can do characterization at 50 bar, for example, at 80 bar, at whatever you like. What is important about in this, te this technique, which is why I did, is because when you are working in high pressure, okay, you get to a point where the activity of your catalyst start dropping, you need to know why. Okay? Nice paper is a preparation of a catalyst, is a characterization, testing, and the cause of poisoning of your catalyst, okay? 
But when you like to have the poisoning catalyst, you cannot take the catalyst from the reactor. If you take it out, it will see oxygen, it will oxidize the surface, you don't see anything. So you need to characterize your catalyst in situ. And this is why it's almost mandatory for me to do this small, small device. So we, we sell a lot of reactors. For example, the Balamand University have three of the, our reactors. And they connect these things here, and they can characterize the catalyst under high pressure in situ without moving it. So any kind of flowing technique, just have to have a flowing technique. You connect it to this device. It has its own TCD, its own mass flow controller. You go to TPR, pulse chemisorption, TPO, whatever you like. Okay? But this is one thing. It is this, you can characterize your catalyst at any given pressure. You can do all what we have seen here. Seen here is atmospheric pressure. What about the isobars? The isobars. Yes, it wants to change the temperature to the. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 you have to have an oven, okay? Yes. You just uh, do analysis at uh, 35 degrees C. Mm -hmm. You raise the temperature to 100 degrees C. Yeah. Okay. Oh, the only thing. But you need a microprocessor for accurate temperatures. Why is it? You need a micro. Yeah, but you can you can insert you can insert a thermocouple. This is very easy. Okay. It's not that sensitive to know exactly. No, this is this is within five or eight degrees. That's matter. Does not change too much. So not okay. Very no. Yeah, you can you can stick a thermocouple beside the sample tube. Okay. We, we I have uh, people has a TC, they have the the three flex. Okay. I just did fifteen units. Okay, the first one, the first one, and I think we sold already twelve or thirteen. Yesterday we got two order from China. Because it's not yet, it's not done yet. Okay, but everybody, I, I promoted it. Everybody loved it because they don't have, for example, like this one here. You missed the TCD, but then if you like, you can have this small device. You connect it, and you can have the TCD, and you have TPR, TPO, post chemistry, everything you want. Okay, it's a very small, very small unit. So, and what's nice about it. You finish here, you have another reactor, you can move it and put it another way. Because it has its own, the only thing is needs the gases, okay? It has its small mass flow controller, has TCD, and it has a cold trap. Okay, because when you do TPR, okay, if the TPR is the, is the production of the TP, the, the, for the TPR is the water. But I need, I'm not interested about the water, I'm interested about the consumption of hydrogen. But they appear at the same time, okay? The water is forming out and the hydrogen down. So the largest amount of water coming out, the less hydrogen you get. So you need to trap the water. This, this technique has a Peltier, which cool off to minus 15 degrees C and trap the water. So the water will not go to the TCD. So you can quantify the amount of hydrogen. OK? So this is one of the solutions you can have here, is, is if you're interested. So what is the minimum detection limit for this device? 5 ppm of hydrogen. 5 ppm, 5 ppm of hydrogen. It has a filament with golded filament, which you can do, for example, sulfide. Okay, no problem. As long as your system can hold it, the TCD can hold it because it's no problem. As a golded filament, and uh, now I'm, it's, I'm leaving tomorrow and next Saturday I'm coming to Spain to finish all the testing, and uh, we have to deliver the system. It has a loop? Yeah, of course. For the pulse can be solution, we have its own loop. It's a calibrated loop. Okay, so you inject and you know the TPR, they get the pulse chemisorption to quantify the dispersion of the, of course. If you don't have a loop, you're missing half of the information. Has a loop and has TCD, so everything to do with all these techniques. So you, some people, for example, they, they build their own reactor, okay? As long as you have an oven and you can control it, okay? You connect the inlet and outlet to the system and you can do TPR, pulse chemisorption, anything you want. Just TCD. Just TCD. Any more questions? Do you like it? Do you like the, the, the... It's wonderful. Huh? It's wonderful. Thank you. Next time I came here, maybe give you a course on TPR only. It's so beautiful. Uh, this, uh, this stuff related to Qatar should be courses in the university. We study classical text only. We are not in an interface with applied chemistry. If you tell this to people, they won't know you're talking about chemistry. Chemistry is just theoretical. No interface with the applied. So when, when you go to the applied, then you... But not with this depth. Yeah, they are related to flow, masses, scaling up, but not for characterization of materials. Okay, you, ha you have my book now. My book is explain everything about this. <laughs> Thank you. Will we also have the slides? And yes. yes. We sell them. <laughs> <laughs> she got scared. <laughs> 
he, he, he's selling us, not us. 50-50. 50-50. 50-50. That's a dollar. No, no, it's a pleasure for me <laughs> just to know you <laughs> learned <laughs> something <laughs> from me. That's, this is very important for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. and. Uh,